It can be easy to brush away stories of the paranormal, no matter how terrifying the case might be if real. But the circumstances surrounding these particular paranormal cases can send shivers up the spines of skeptics. Number 5 With more than 8 million artifacts taken from locations around the globe, it's not surprising that there are more than a few supposedly cursed items at the British Museum in London. According to visitors and even some that work there, there are many spirits and phantoms that still walk the halls of the 18th century building. But only one of the spirits from the museum has the power to travel beyond the building and into the tunnels below. Of the many different exhibits at the British Museum, there's one group of artifacts that seems to have much more paranormal activity than the others. Ever since the museum's inception, it has displayed ancient artifacts from Egypt. Those include ivory and stone statues, stone tablets, and of course, the famous mummies. There are currently 140 mummies and coffins on display at the museum, the largest collection outside of Egypt. Unfortunately, many of the objects on display didn't come from professional or organized archaeological digs. Egyptomania in the 19th century resulted in many going to the ancient sites and pillaging whatever they could find. This meant a lot of the grave goods were separated from the mummies they were supposed to be used for, and even the mummies themselves were separated from their mummy boards and sarcophagi. The disturbing practices in Victorian Britain meant many mummies didn't actually survive Egyptomania. Of the many items that have become separated from their mummy, Exhibit number 22542 might be the most famous and the most haunted. The exhibit number refers to an item known as the Unlucky Mummy. It's a mummy board made from wood and covered in plaster. It's believed to have been made around 950 BC, which would have been during Egypt's 21st dynasty. The board would have been placed on top of the mummy itself and lie inside the coffin itself. Most mummy boards were decorated in a way that would represent the person who is being buried. Unfortunately, the person this mummy board was made for remains a mystery. There are no identifying inscriptions on the board itself, and it's become separated from the other objects that it was buried with. The museum believes it was found in Thebes, but it cannot be more specific. The item was donated to the museum in 1889. According to the story that comes with the unlucky mummy, the board was brought to England by four men who found it in an ancient Egyptian tomb. Soon after, all four would lose their lives. Two met a violent fate while the other two became impoverished and passed away due to related illnesses. The mummy board fell into possession of the sister of one of the men, but the curse continued. She decided to donate it to the British Museum. According to the museum website, it was donated by Mrs. Warwick Hunt on behalf of her brother, Arthur F. Wheeler. Thirteen other items were donated by Wheeler through Hunt. Nine of those were mummified crocodiles, but Wheeler also donated the hand of a human mummy, wrapped in linen and wearing a scarab ring. Two decorated ostrich eggs and a linen bag were also donated. It's not known if these all came from the same tomb or if this was a collection Wheeler had gathered from many locations. Despite the lack of any identification, the keeper of Egyptian rooms, Ernest Wallace Butch, was quick to identify the person the mummy board belonged to. It was believed that the high-quality piece had to have belonged to someone important in Thebes. He suggested the woman was a priestess of the cult Amun-Ra or Amun-Ra, which was the patron deity of Thebes, a moon fused with the sun god Ra. The priests of Amun would have been very powerful at the time that the object was created though it was made at a time after the worship of Amun-Ra specifically was at its strongest. Whether or not Budge was accurate with his identification, the association with Amun-Ra has stuck in pop culture, if not in the museum itself. It wasn't long after the mummy board was brought to the museum that news of the cursed object spread. There were reports in newspapers in 1904 about the curse of the mummy. Printed in the Daily Express was the story of four men who found the mummy board and the misfortune that fell upon them. The journalist who wrote the story would pass away three years later at the age of 37 due to a fever. He was added to the list of potential victims of the priestess of Amun-Ra. Then there were reports of people who had seen the mummy board in the museum. 
visitors apparently felt a strange sensation, and one was hit with cardiac pains while viewing the mummy board. These stories predated even the discovery of King Tut's tomb by 18 years. It was the mummy curse before the famous mummy curse. But the wrath of the priestess of Amun-Ra has spread beyond those who visit her mummy board. One year after the Wheeler artifacts were donated to the British Museum, the British Museum station opened. This was an underground station on the Central London Railway, the original Central Line. The entrance to the museum was located at 133 High Holborn, just a six-minute walk away from the museum. The train line didn't run directly underneath the museum itself, but it was close enough that the priestess of Amun-Ra supposedly traveled to the station. According to legends, witnesses saw a figure wearing a loincloth in what was described as a traditional Egyptian headdress. She would haunt the tunnels and her scream could be heard. In 1933, the British Museum Station was closed. Holborn Station had been opened not far from the British Museum Station, and it had just been expanded to incorporate the central line. The British Museum Station was no longer needed. That should have been the end of the priestess hauntings, but she apparently traveled through the tunnels to the Holborn Station. In April of 1935, two women disappeared from the platform on the Holborn Station. According to legend, Markings were found on the walls of the British Museum station during the investigation. That station should have been inaccessible to visitors, but apparently the priestess could take people there. There are other legends surrounding the unlucky mummy. According to one story, museum staff were so spooked by the object that they put it in storage and replaced it with a replica. An American Egyptologist uncovered the fake and threatened to expose the museum if the real mummy board wasn't sold to him. The museum agreed and in April of 1912, he boarded a ship to the US with the relic. Unfortunately for him, that ship was the Titanic. The story suggests the unlucky mummy was responsible for that tragedy too. The British Museum claims that story at least is nonsense and the real unlucky mummy can still be seen in one of the ancient Egyptian galleries there. Visitors should be careful to avoid the other ghosts that supposedly haunt the museum. Security guards have reported seeing bright orbs floating in rooms on CCTV cameras, but when they go to check, there's nothing there. Others have reported doors that were shut and bolted moments earlier, being discovered open. In one case, a security guard was trying to close the door to the exhibit that displays the finds from the Sutton Hoo burial, only to find something pushing against him. Hands knocked him back, and his supervisor witnessed him flying through the air before landing on the floor. With so many artifacts, many taken haphazardly from their previous resting place, it wouldn't be surprising if there were a few restless spirits in the building. Number 4. In August of 1942, thousands of men lost their lives on the beaches of France. The disturbing events may have been captured in the stones of the beaches themselves, leaving behind an echo witnessed years later. Residual hauntings are one of the most commonly reported hauntings. The ghostly specters go about their day as if they were still alive, not noticing the terrified people watching them. Some move through walls that were built after their passing, not letting our presence hinder theirs. While scary, many of these hauntings show the person's everyday life. It's as if the repeated movements are etched into the place, even after the person is gone. But sometimes it's traumatic events that etch those movements onto a place. Wars, by nature, are devastating and traumatic. There are many stories of ghostly figures trapped in what were likely some of the most terrifying moments of their lives on battlefields around the world. The most famous of these may be the Gettysburg Ghosts, some of which have been captured on camera. These ghosts wander across the old battlefield, not knowing that the war is long over. According to some witnesses, this has also happened on the beaches of Dieppe. Dieppe is a seaport in northern France, with shingle and pebble-covered beaches that lie beneath the white cliffs in many cases. Today, it's a picturesque landscape and one of the busiest ports in France. It receives a good deal of tourism, with people attracted to the area for its history and small idyllic-looking cafes and independent shops. But 80 years ago, it was the scene of one of the most devastating conflicts during the Second World War. Operation Jubilee was the name given to the raid. It had developed from a previous plan, Operation Rudder. 
By 1942, Germany had occupied France, and the Allied forces were looking for a way to get a jumping off point on the continent. Previously, groups of a few hundred commandos had conducted raids on the continent. They were designed to capture technology or destroy key locations. It also forced Germany to spread its troops more thinly to be ready for any threat. But Operation Jubilee wasn't going to be a few hundred soldiers. Instead, more than 6,000 soldiers took place in the operation. Most were Canadian, but there were around 1,000 British troops as well as 50 Americans. This was the first time during the war that Americans would set foot on the European continent. During the planning stages, the plan for Operation Jubilee changed. Previously, there had been plans for paratroopers and waves of RAF planes to take out German artillery before the amphibious invasion, but the amount of air support the troops would get gradually dwindled. The amphibious invasion would be the main focus. The choice of Dieppe was also a strange one. Dieppe was much further east than the beaches that would later be the scenes of the D-Day invasion. The cliffs gave the defending forces a key strategic advantage, being able to attack from above. The pebble-covered beaches also wouldn't have been as strategically good for any attackers compared to the sandy beaches further west. Dieppe was within range of the RAF fighter craft, though, which may have helped swing the decision of where to launch the raid. The raid wasn't to get any specific equipment held in Dieppe or to destroy a strategic location. Officially, it seemed to be to try out invading and taking a port. Though there are arguments that Dieppe didn't contribute much and that planners wouldn't have figured out another way. Whatever the reason, 6,000 men, separated into a number of divisions, attacked the beaches on the morning of August 19, 1942. It was supposed to be a show of strength, especially with America's first men on the ground. It was a disaster, though. The operation was plagued with problems from the start. Even before the start of the actual raid, at 3.47 a.m., the raiding party was discovered by German forces, and a battle at sea took place. The Germans pulled out of that battle but came with full force against the invading troops when they reached the shores. At exactly 5.07 a.m., the first wave of Canadian troops hit the ground. The attacks came in waves, but none were met with success. By 7 a.m., the survivors were trying to evacuate as Germans picked them off one by one from above. Above, RAF planes started off attacking ground targets, but then got into fights with German planes, adding to the devastation. Across Dieppe, more than a thousand Allied soldiers lost their lives. Two thousand more were taken as prisoners of war. Planes and ships were also lost. For many, it was seen as a waste of life. Some believed that the Dieppe raid was actually a cover for a more secretive mission to try to steal an Enigma machine from the Axis forces. If that was the plan all along, the Dieppe raid was even more of a disaster, as the machine wasn't recovered at that point. With so much devastation, it's not too unbelievable that the spirits of those lost might be left behind. In 1951, two British women, their children, and a nurse were visiting the area on vacation. They stayed in a guest house near the shore, but the angle of the cliff meant that they couldn't actually see the beach from their rooms. The women were given the aliases Mrs. Dorothy Norton and her sister-in-law Agatha. At about 4 a.m. on August 4th, 1951, Dorothy was awoken by what sounded like a storm at sea. But as she listened closer, it was clear this wasn't a storm. It was a battle. That alone could have been written off as a strange dream. But 20 minutes later, Agnes was awoken by the same noise. Over the next three hours or so, they listened to sounds of battle. They then went out to the balcony to look, but there was nothing to see out on the sea, and the beach itself was out of sight. But it definitely sounded like most of the noise came from the beach. There was the noise of crashes, like something heavy falling from the sky onto the shingle-covered beaches. There were the shouts and cries of men. One of the women wrote down some of the words being shouted. It was a language she didn't understand, so she simply wrote them out phonetically. They could hear the loud bangs of something being fired from the cliffs and the sounds of planes overhead. But by 7 a.m., the sounds had completely faded into nothingness. They were able to fall back to sleep, and when they asked other guests later that day, none had heard anything. One of the guests was a light sleeper who had previously been woken up by the quietest of noises, but she had apparently not heard anything. The woman found the whole event very strange. 
they'd made detailed notes of what had happened and when. After returning home to England, the two women went to the Society for Psychical Research with their story. Researchers discovered that the timeline of the women's phantom battle and the timelines of the Dieppe raid were almost identical. The women reported waves of battle just like the real thing, which started at exactly 507. The battle at sea would have been when the Germans discovered and attacked the raiding force out on the open water. Even more convincing, the words that had been written phonetically were actually German military talk. Neither woman had any detailed knowledge of the Dieppe raid before their strange paranormal experience. Both knew the sounds of military aircraft and were certain that they hadn't just heard civilian planes flying overhead. But Dieppe itself wasn't a battle they were familiar with. They also didn't speak German and would have had no way of faking the German military orders. The guest house that the women were staying in had been utilized by German soldiers during the war. Researchers at the society believed that the women were telling the truth and had really witnessed an echo of the battle that had taken place roughly nine years earlier. So far, there have been no similar stories of a complete echo from the beaches of Dieppe, but there are reports of shadow people that have been encountered near the water's edge. It's possible that Dorothy and Agnes aren't the only ones to have had terrifying paranormal experiences there. Number 3 Just outside the city of Pripyat, the most devastating nuclear disaster in history took place at the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. Officially, the cause of the disaster was a mixture of human error, design flaws, and poor safety protocols. But if the existence of a paranormal creature is to be believed, there may have been something otherworldly to blame for the horrors that follow. In April of 1986, a number of people who lived and worked around the nuclear power plant spotted something ominous and strange. It was a creature none had seen before and none could explain. It looked almost human but was completely black in color and had huge wings. The wings spread out to a 10-foot wingspan. Most disturbing of all, it didn't have a head, but instead two burning red eyes in the center of its chest. At least five workers at the plant saw the disturbing creature and reported it to their supervisor. It seems unlikely the supervisor believed them and nothing was written in the official logbooks. But given the lack of safety precautions and regulations being followed at Chernobyl, it's possible that nothing would have been done even if the men were believed. For weeks, the men were haunted by what they had seen. It would visit them in their dreams during terrifying nightmares. Other witnesses received threatening phone calls and some ran into the creature itself even after first spotting it. It was given the name the Blackbird and would have been terrifying enough on its own. But what took place on April 26th put the mysterious paranormal creature in a new light. It was the early morning hours of April 26th when the area around Chernobyl would change forever. A routine safety test was supposed to take place, testing how the turbines would hold up if external power to the plant was lost. During the test, the power produced by Reactor 4 dropped to almost zero and the workers almost completely removed the control rods to try to get the reactor back under control. It worked and the test was completed, but then the reactor was shut down. Localized increases in reactivity took place due to a design flaw. A chain of events led to an eruption of steam and the infamous meltdown took place. Two people lost their lives in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. 28 more plant workers and rescue workers passed away in the following months. The exact number of people who suffered health problems caused by the spread of radioactive particles during the disaster may never be known. Hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated after the disaster, and according to the story of the Black Bird, the creature was seen flying through a cloud of radioactive dust. The story of the Black Bird is commonly told to those who wander into the exclusion zone during official excursions. Some say that the bird lingered in the area afterward and was spotted by some of the cleanup crew, but most believe it left Chernobyl after the disaster. The question remains, was it the cause of the disaster or merely there to warn people of it? Those familiar with paranormal creatures find similarities between the Blackbird and the much more famous Mothman of Point Pleasant in West Virginia. The Mothman was also described as a winged creature, dark gray or black in color with glowing red eyes. It appeared in the Point Pleasant area of West Virginia in November of 1966 
and lingered there for over a year before the Silver Bridge disaster, which claimed the lives of 46 people. After the disaster, reports of the Mothman ended, and people believed that the creature either caused the disaster or warned that it was to come. Others believed that the creature was simply drawn to the location where it knew the tragedy would occur. If the legends are to be believed, it seems likely that the Mothman and the Black Bird are the same species of paranormal creature, if not the same creature itself. The main difference between the Black Bird of Chernobyl and the Mothman is when they were reported. Throughout 1967, people around Point Pleasant made reports about the terrifying creature. It made headlines in local papers, and police officers received calls about the creature. Then the Silver Bridge disaster occurred. The people began to associate the creature with the disaster. In Chernobyl, the first written account of the creature that's been found was written decades after it took place. It's still possible that witnesses saw the creature before the disaster and the legends are true. It's not unimaginable to believe that this was covered up by officials, given how little information was revealed about the nature of the disaster to those that were impacted by it. There are other stories of similar terrifying creatures elsewhere in the world. In Germany, for example, there was a Mothman-like creature spotted above the entrance to a mine in Freiburg shortly before the mine collapsed. Whether these creatures are the cause of the disasters or simply know that they are to occur, they definitely seem to be paranormal warnings of what's to come. Number 2 in the east of England, there's a terrifying legend that may have had some grounds in reality. A paranormal creature prowls lonely country roads and visits churchyards at midnight. The Black Shuck may be a herald of the end or a guardian spirit, but it puts fear into the hearts of anyone that sees it. The story begins with a storm in 1577. Records from villages in Suffolk report a terrifying storm on August 4th of that year. It caused damage to many properties and people lost their lives due to the terror of Mother Nature. But it might not have been the only thing causing damage that day. The fourth was a Sunday and in the town of Bungay, most of the community was in the halls of St. Mary's Church. Not only were they there for service, but it was also considered one of the safest places to wait out the storm. But the church doors flew open during a crack of thunder and a huge ominous black dog ran inside. It attacked two parishioners as they knelt in prayer, quickly taking their lives. Another man was attacked. He apparently shriveled up like burned leather but survived the ordeal. The creature then ran from the church, leaving the terrified community behind. That same day, it appeared 12 miles away in the town of Blybra. There, a similar encounter took place. The community was gathered in the Holy Trinity Church when the Black Shuck appeared. It took the lives of two men and wounded the hand of a third before leaving. Three scorch marks, as if from claws, are still visible in the door to this day. The story of these terrifying encounters was written by Abraham Fleming not long after they took place and shared in a 1577 pamphlet called A Strange and Terrible Wonder. The name Black Shuck wouldn't appear in literature until the 1800s, but it's almost certainly what the people of Bungay and Blybra saw. The story seemed fantastical, but it was easy for the people of Suffolk and the surrounding areas to believe. Many had disturbing stories of their own. Stories of a scary, paranormal dog were nothing new, even in the 1500s. Like many places in the world, there were stories of the great hunts that would take place on stormy nights. The sound of the wind was supposedly Odin or some other hunter and his dogs, chasing their prey through the woods or some other secluded area. To witness the hunt would be costly. It was a myth designed to keep people indoors during the dangerous weather. But the Black Shuck differed from any of these stories. It prowled alone and wasn't part of some hunt. Many times, it was seen on clear nights with no bad weather in sight. It was not owned by anyone, except possibly the devil himself. This was something altogether different from the other legends. Like any cryptid or paranormal creature, Descriptions of it vary, but there are a few details that never change. The Black Shuck is a huge, ominous dog with shaggy fur. Sometimes it's able to go about without a head. Other times it has fiery eyes the size of saucers. Sometimes it only has one red eye in the center of its head, like that of a cyclops. Its howl would put fear into the hearts of anyone who saw it, but its footsteps were silent. 
The black shuck mostly seems to wander down lonely roads, but it's also said to visit various churchyards at midnight. One story specifically connects the creature with the town of Overstrand and the village of Beeston in Norfolk. According to that story, the black shuck was friends with a Dane and a Saxon who drowned at sea. The Dane washed ashore in Beeston and the Saxon in Overstrand. The black shuck would spend the rest of its days running along the coast between its two friends. This is one of the few positive legends surrounding the origin of the beast, but not all stories about this terrifying paranormal creature portray it as a bad thing. The most common of these stories about the black shuck describe it as a herald or a bringer of the end. Seeing the great black dog means the person will pass away before the end of the year. Sometimes the victims will meet their fate instantaneously. In other stories, people are safe if they respect the dog. One story tells of two friends driving along a lonely road when they spotted the black shuck. The passenger told his friend to stop, but the driver ignored him. As soon as the car hit the dog, the driver lost his life. But in most encounters with the black shuck, nobody loses their life. This makes sense. Someone has to live to tell the tale. A more recent encounter with the black shuck took place in Blybra at some point between 1978 and 1985. A policeman driving north on the A12 crossed paths with a black dog, which he described as being as big as a child's pony. It darted from the woods on one side of the road and into the marshes on the other side. At the time, the police officer had never heard of the black shuck, only learning about it later in a newspaper article. He claimed he'd never seen a dog like the creature he had witnessed that night and believed it might not have been a dog at all. Another story from Blybra comes from a man named John McLaughlin, who saw the creature in 1973 while laying new sewer lines behind Blybra Church. He was alone when he heard what sounded like a dog panting very close behind him, but when he turned around, there was nothing there. John described the encounter as uncanny. He also knew nothing about the legend of the black shuck at the time and was only told of the creature afterward. The following year, John suffered a passing in the family and believes the black shuck may have been a warning. It might be easy to write off the black shuck as nothing more than folklore, but a strange discovery made in 2014 may indicate that there's much more truth to this story than there might seem. Archaeologists in Suffolk were excavating the grounds of the old Leyston Abbey when they came across something strange. It was the skeleton of a dog buried in an unmarked grave 20 meters deep. While a dog buried in a churchyard was strange enough, this dog was 7 feet long and would have weighed 14 stone when alive. We have no idea what color its fur would have been, but the size alone would have made it terrifying. Researchers also believe it would have lived and passed away at around the same time that the 1577 sightings took place. There are today extremely large dogs that aren't paranormal, but if there were dogs of this size in the area at the time, it might explain some of the more mundane yet scary stories. It wouldn't explain the many more recent stories though, and something paranormal may yet be responsible for the strange sightings. Number 1 Time slips are some of the most mysterious paranormal phenomena to occur. They aren't really understood by even people who claim to be paranormal experts, and the people who experience them are left baffled and confused by the events. Some believe our understanding of how time works is flawed, and that time slips are a natural occurrence due to how time really works. There's a theory that the past, present, and future are all happening at once, but as humans, we can only experience what we call the present. Perhaps momentary glimpses into the past are simply caused by our minds perceiving things that they were never meant to perceive. Often, time slips are simply one-off events that occur at random and cannot be predicted, but some locations have a stranger relationship with the past. Of those, Liverpool's Bold Street probably has the most recorded incidents of time slips of any one location. Bold Street lies in Liverpool city centre and has existed since the 1700s. It was originally built for rope manufacturing for ships before houses were built to accommodate workers for the nearby dock. Over the centuries, the street has changed a lot. Today, it's mostly pedestrianised, with typical high street stores. But on occasion, the design of Bold Street slips back into another time. In 2006, 
a young man named Sean was visiting stores on Bolt Street. He was shoplifting, and at one point, a shop security guard spotted what he was doing. The guard chased after Sean, and Sean ran through Bolt Street, trying to slip away from the security guard. He dove down a dead-end alley and was certain that he was going to be caught, but when he turned around, the guard was gone. Sean felt a strange sensation in his chest. At first, he thought the running might have caused a medical emergency, but then he realized it was something around him that was making him feel strange. He left the alley to find Bold Street had changed. It was no longer pedestrianized and old-fashioned cars drove down the street. The roadworks that he had noticed in one area had completely vanished. The people around him were also wearing old-fashioned clothing. Sean began to panic and tried to use his cell phone, only to find that he didn't have any service. When he wandered down the street, he found a news station. Outside was a display of the local papers, which showed the date to be the 18th of May, 1964. The young man realized something very strange had happened, and quickly walked away from the spot where he had apparently slipped back into time. As he got further away from the alleyway, things started to change back to normal. By the time he reached a jewelry store, everything was back to the way it had been in 2006, and he had service on his phone again. But when he looked back, he saw the 1960s at the end of the street. Sean jumped on a bus and headed home, trying to make sense of the strange occurrence. What makes Sean's story so strange is that it had a witness. Sean talked to people, including the media, about his experience. That alone was rather strange. Why Sean would confess to shoplifting if he had gotten away with the crime is also strange. But after the story came out, the security guard came forward. He told a newspaper that he had chased the shoplifter into an alleyway, only to watch Sean vanish in front of his eyes. Another story came from an off-duty policeman named Frank. Frank was visiting Liverpool with his wife one Saturday in July of 1996. His wife, Carol, wanted to go to the bookstore on Bold Street named Dylan's to pick up a copy of the book Train Spotting. As they walked towards the store, Frank bumped into an old friend and they began chatting. Carol went on ahead, leaving the two men behind talking. After a few minutes, Frank carried on but made a detour into a music store to buy a CD. Finally, he began to make his way toward Dylan's bookstore. When he arrived at the location of the store, he found the name above the door had changed. It was now called Crips. Displayed in the shop window weren't books, but ladies' clothing and handbags. As he stared at the store, a small box van drove past him. The van and the horn that it blasted were like something from the 1950s, and Frank was left confused. After all, this area was supposed to be pedestrianized. He noticed the name Kaplan's painted on the side of the van. Looking around, Frank noticed a lot of people dressed in old-fashioned clothing. But there was one woman that stood out. She was dressed like a normal young woman in the 1990s, with a bright green sleeveless top. She headed into Crips, and Frank followed her. Once they were inside, the interior suddenly appeared to be that of a bookstore. People were wearing ordinary 1990s clothing, and everything seemed to be as expected. The woman who had entered the store with Frank looked confused and remarked that she thought this had been a new clothing store but must have been mistaken. She left and Frank found his wife. Carol had noticed nothing strange and couldn't explain what her husband had gone through. Frank told his story repeatedly and it was always the same. A researcher into the time slip paranormal phenomenon came across Frank's story and told it on a local TV show. As soon as the show aired, the program was contacted by local historians, who revealed that Dylan's occupied a spot that had previously been a women's clothing store named Cripps. Kaplan's was also a local business from the 1950s that would have had vans in the area. All of this was news to Frank, who knew nothing of the area's history. Most of the Liverpool Bond Street time slips are similar to these two stories. People are walking on or approaching the road when everything suddenly seems to resemble the 1950s or 60s. People dress strangely and old-fashioned cars look brand new. Some have suggested that instead of actually being transported back in time, these people simply stumble across vintage car meetups or some history festival. But if this is the case, nobody from these meetups or festivals has ever come forward to dispute the stories. It also wouldn't explain why nobody else at the time of the events witnessed the same thing, or as in Sean's case, the unfortunate time traveler was witnessed disappearing. One suggestion is that the circular layout of the subway lines beneath Liverpool city centre 
caused the time slips in some way. Whatever the cause of this paranormal phenomenon, it terrifies those who are caught in it. We're left wondering if they'll ever be able to make it home. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.